sounds like a video game. Which is what you're saying. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our Tuesday morning Carolina College Biblical Studies Chapel. We're glad you're here in person, also online. After we pray, we're going to join together in singing and worship, and then followed by a great time of study in the Word. We see here Mr. David Probus is going to lead us in singing, so we know that'll be a blessing, um, as it always is to the others who normally lead us in this regard. <laughs> this we're trying to say. <laughs> Always is. Always is. <laughs> and our speaker for this morning is Mr. Jason Whitfield. He may be newer to many of you. Um, he is scheduled to teach culture of the Bible in the spring term. But he is currently the pastor of Island Grove Baptist Church in Pembroke. And he earned his Doctor of Ministry from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, prior to that would be his MDiv from Luther Rice. And most importantly, he earned his BA from CCBS back in 2005. So we know that uh, this is going to be great. Um, and uh, so we'll look forward to that, spending time in the Word together. Well, let's join our hearts in prayer. As we uh, recognize the purpose for why we've gathered together, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together, assembling us this morning. We recognize the abiding love in which we dwell. And thank you for being the living God to provide our needs for now and all eternity. As we recognize the precious gift of the Lord Jesus Christ and his completed work on the cross for our salvation. Uh, thank you for giving us opportunity to gather and to give you praise and honor and glory and to receive the message of your word this morning. We commit this time and ourselves to you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Right. So we're going to sing one. Uh, it, traditionally, we're in the season of Advent, and as they were looking for the first coming of the Lord Jesus, we are also in Advent looking for Jesus' second coming. So uh, we're going to sing the, the, the old hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. If you guys want to stand up, if you want to sit down, I'm sitting down. <laughs> I'm sitting down. Here we go. Yeah. 
Couldn't get the pins to turn. <laughs> uh, the next one we'll do is just a good old praise hymn. Glorify thy name. today. I um, thank you so much for those beautiful songs. Boy, those were yes, sir. some beautiful songs this morning. Oh, right. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> get out of the way. Oh, my goodness. Anyone stay up there the whole time? Oh, my goodness. Well, he's uh, probably like me. I am uh, very apprehensive to be here before you this morning, uh, but I feel very privileged and honored to be able to have the opportunity to stand here during chapel service. I am still trying to figure out how, how it is that I got here this morning and how this appointment arranged for me to be here instead of uh, someone else, but I, I do take it as a great honor and privilege. Uh, but again, as I said earlier, I count it as a great apprehension as well. I feel like uh, Dr. David Allen uh, when he was standing at the pastor's conference in Jacksonville, Florida one year when he said, he said, you know, he said, I, I'm very apprehensive to stand before you today, he said, because no one's more critical of preaching than preachers. <laughs> and uh, I'm standing here today before you again with great apprehension, not only because of colleagues, but also because of other preachers that are here as well. Uh, but I do have the distinct privilege today to stand before you and to look at a passage of Scripture today out of the wonderful Gospel of John. And we're going to look, in chap look at a passage of Scripture in chapter 20 today. So while you're turning there with me this morning, I'd like to share, you know, this is a beautiful time of the year. We see Christmas is approaching. And uh, one thing that we love in our home is Christmas time. Uh, my children love uh, Christmas time, not only, I guess, for the gifts, but also uh, for the wonderful tradition that we have as well. Um, our children now have grown up. Our, our daughter's getting ready to graduate college. Our son, he's married and has two children. I'm a grandfather. That's hard to believe, Dr. Dickerson. Uh, but, uh, but we used to have a tradition uh, that whenever Christmas time came around, there were certain groups of movies that we would love to watch. Uh, one of those groups of movies was the Santa Claus series, uh, where you had Tim Allen playing Scott Calvin, who is Santa Claus, right? And my daughter just loves those movies. Even when she comes home now uh, during Christmas time, she's ready to watch those series of movies. And I mean consecutively, too, uh, if she can. <laughs> Uh, but, but in one of those movies, uh, one of those series, I think it's Santa Claus 2, Scott Calvin finds himself in an interesting predicament. He's in a situation where Bernard, I guess the chief 
elf comes to him. He's the holder of the Christmas handbook. And he comes to him and tells him that he's found another clause as it pertains to his office as being Santa. And the clause is a Mrs. Claus. And so what they find out is that he has to find a wife, get married in just a few days. And so all of a sudden, if he does not find a wife in a few days before Christmas Eve, then the desanification uh, <laughs> process begins. <laughs> and so in the midst of him finding all of this information out, he begins to go through the process of losing weight, his beard shrinks, and then he's got to start his process of finding a wife and, and get, or finding a wife for someone to marry him. Uh, but in that process, he finds out that his son Charlie is on the naughty list. And so he heads back home to not only find a wife and get married in a couple of days, but also to deal with his son Charlie and the misbehaving that's going on because he's on the naughty list. Well, as the story goes, if you've seen the movie, he goes back and he's there dealing with his son. His son is so upset because of the principal uh, that is at his school will not decorate for Christmas. And so Charlie takes the initiative and his part of his misbehavior is actually painting uh, Christmas murals, murals, if you will, all across the school on the lockers and the gymnasium. And so you see Scott Calvin, who's Santa Claus, Tim Allen, he's back and forth with the principal. He doesn't like the principal at first, Miss Carol, but then after a period of time, he, he finds her to be a, a wonderful, interesting person, so he asks her out on a date. And then after a couple of dates, uh, he finally realizes that this is the one for me. And so he then actually says, well, you know, I need to tell her who I really am. And so he begins that process of telling her who he is, and she refuses to believe. And so as the process goes on, we see that uh, Tim Allen, uh, Scott Calvin, he finds out that there's problems at the North Pole, so he uh, enlists the help of the two fairy, goes back to the North Pole to deal with some problems that he's having there. But while he's gone, Charlie goes to Mrs. Carroll. And he tries to help Mrs. Carroll believe that Scott Calvin is Santa Claus. And so he pulls out this snow globe as he's talking with her and trying to convince her that he's Santa Claus. And as he holds the snow globe there, that snow globe begins to move. And by certain magic, according to the movie, he's, uh, they're able to see the North Pole and everything that's going on there. And so when she sees that, then she believes that he's Santa. And so we see that that takes place. But, you know, sometimes in life, aren't we as human beings like that as well? That unless we see something, if we can't see it or, or touch it, then we really won't believe in it. Well, you know, there's an interesting passage, a portion of Scripture in chapter 20 of the Gospel of John. Specifically, we know the climax of the Gospel uh, of John in chapter 20 is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But in the midst of this, we see an individual by the name of Thomas. And he's in similar category as Mrs. Carroll in the sense that he won't believe unless he sees. And I'd like to look at this passage of Scripture today, starting there with verse uh, number 24, if you will, in chapter 20. 20 of the gospel of John and listen to what it says in verse number 24 it says now Thomas called the twin or Didymus uh, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came and we see here starting out in this passage of scripture we're going to see if you will believing is seeing but more than that we're going to see two aspects of this passage of scripture we're going to see unbelief and then we're going to look at belief but in the midst of the unbelief and the belief there's some transitions that that take place inside of those certain areas. And we're going to see these transitions that transpire. Well, first of all, we're going to see what transpires according to the text regarding unbelief. It says, now Thomas was called the twin. There's not a lot that's known about Thomas through the scriptures. In regards to him being mentioned in the synoptic gospels, he's only mentioned whenever the 12 disciples are mentioned. Uh, when we see the book of Acts, he's mentioned there in the book of Acts, but he's only mentioned when they're listing the 12 disciples. But John actually gives two instances, if you will, where Thomas actually speaks. 
This in chapter 20 is one of those incidences. The other one is in chapter 11 of the Gospel of John. In John chapter 11, we see that Jesus is there and he gets the report of Lazarus and Lazarus is sick. Mary sends him report. Jesus stays a few days. He realizes that uh, Lazarus has died. He tells the disciples that Lazarus, has, uh, Lazarus is asleep. And they say, well, if he's asleep, why do we need to go back? And then finally he says that Lazarus is dead and he says, I'm glad for your sakes so that you might believe. And then we see an interesting comment because here's one of the other comments that we see from Thomas out of the whole Bible and it's found in chapter 11 where he makes the comment and he says this, he says, let us go back and that we may die with him. And he's not referring to Lazarus, but he's referring to Jesus. And so that's something that we find out about Thomas just in that statement. We find out that he was committed to the Lord Jesus. He was committed even to the sense that he was willing to go back and die with him. But here in this text, we're going to see a different aspect of Thomas. We're going to see a different side of Thomas. And I love what Myers says. Myers says this. He declares that Jesus actually gave Thomas the name Didymus, which means twin, for the purpose of signifying that his nature was one in which was halted and was divided between the old and the new man. And I believe that we can see that not only from chapter 11 and how committed he was to Christ, but then now in chapter 20 where we see that he's doubting and in unbelief, if you will, with Christ. Listen to what it goes on to say. It says, Now Thomas called the twin. One of the twelve was not with them or with them when Jesus came. What he's referring to is he's referring to a prior occurrence. A prior occurrence, the Sabbath, the seven days before this or eight days prior to this, on the Sabbath when Jesus appeared to the other ten disciples. Thomas was not there, but he appeared to them and then he showed himself to them, showed them his hands and showed them his side. But Thomas was not there. And the scriptures really never say why Thomas was not there. There are, have been a lot of speculations, I guess, over the years of why Thomas was not there. We find out that some believe that he was not there because he was in a deep, sorrow, sorrowful state to the point that he was grieving because of the loss of his Savior. But he was different in the sense that this, some scholars say that he wanted to go off and grieve alone. And that's maybe a, a speculation that we can take and, and maybe consider as why he was not there with the other disciples. But we know that he was not there when, the other, uh, when Jesus uh, appeared to the other disciples. But listen to verse number 25. And then it says this, The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. So he said unto them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the uh, into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. What we see taking place here is one of the things that transpires on unbelief in this section is we see the testimony of the disciples. The disciples actually tell, they testify of the witness that they had uh, actually had, and that was that they sell the risen Savior. One of the aspects of that is this. I know that in the Greek tense, along in the Garland state, that is written from this perspective, if you will, that they had shared this with him in a repeated affirmation. Meaning that maybe not one shared it, baby, but maybe a couple shared it in that sense. But we see that also that by Jesus showing himself as being the risen Lord, that goes back to reiterate the wonderful aspect of Acts chapter 1, doesn't it? Where Jesus has declared that he showed himself or presented himself alive by many infallible proofs. One of the things that we find out about Jesus and his resurrection is that through certain convincing evidence, Jesus showed himself to be risen from the dead. We know that according to Scripture. Even the Apostle Paul goes to expand it far beyond the Gospels when he makes the statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus was seen above 500 at once in his res resurrected state. So we know that Jesus has presented himself, but then now we see the testimony of the disciples, but then now we're going to see the terms of Thomas. Listen to what Thomas goes back to say. He says this as he hears what they've said. As he hears the testimony from the disciples, Thomas's response was this. He said to them, he says, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger in the print of the nails and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. It's interesting because some call the unless here a double negative. And it's almost as though what Thomas is saying, he's saying, unless I see, unless I touch, 
I am not going to believe. It's though that Thomas was adamant to the point that he was not going to believe. You know, some find it interesting that there's not the word it after the word believe. The NIV puts the word it after believe, but in the New King James and the New American Standard, it's not there. But through Longman and Garland, I think they actually state that it would be appropriate to put the word it there because it clarifies what Thomas is stating in the context. What Thomas is not saying that if he doesn't touch Jesus, if he doesn't see Jesus, then he's not going to believe in Jesus. But it actually means that if he doesn't touch the nail prints in his hand, if he doesn't touch his side, then he's not going to believe in the resurrected Lord, that he's risen if you will. And so that's the text that he's referring to, and this is what he's referring to, and we see that he's stating that here in this text, and he's adamant about that. But you know, is Thomas really different than the other disciples? You know, the other disciples, if we go back and we look at them, there was a period of time when they refused to believe, didn't they? If you go back and you look at the, uh, the morning, uh, that wonderful, beautiful morning, that Sabbath morning, that Sunday, when Jesus had rose from the grave and you see Mary Magdalene and you see Joanna and you see Mary, the mother of James and other women who went to the tomb that morning and then they did not see Jesus in the tomb and the tomb was empty and then they had the experience of seeing two angels there speaking to them. They come back and they come back to the disciples and they tell the disciples that, that Jesus is not there and they get the report and then this is what happens. Luke 24 and 11 says this, and their words seemed to them like idle tales and they did not believe them. So we understand that they would not believe that Jesus has risen. But you know also is Thomas not much different from if you will the disciples but is Thomas not much different from us today? You know there are periods of times inside of our lives where I think that we find ourselves in a state of unbelief don't we? What about in times of trouble when trouble comes our way? You know, when trouble comes our way, maybe it's through a diagnosis or maybe it's through, uh, maybe through children and their problems with them or maybe through family members or maybe problems and troubles at the church. And we find ourselves in a situation where we just can't believe God is going to see us through this. You know, we look at the state of our church sometimes and we say, did God really send me here? Can these people really change? You know, and we look at those situations and those circumstances like that. You know what's interesting is that there's been a lot of speculation to why Thomas did not believe. Do you know that there's speculation out there that says that Thomas did not believe because he actually wanted to be certain that what the disciples saw in the resurrected Lord was not just a vision? There are some also that have said that he was uh, so shocked by the crucifixion that he couldn't process everything was going on. Morris, I think, stated that. Alfred said that he had gotten to the point that he had lost all hope. You know, there are certain situations and troubles that can come our way where we feel like that we lose all hope, don't we? But you know, there's also other times inside of our lives where we might doubt God and maybe move to a state of unbelief. What about times of calling where God calls us to a certain ministry? Whether God calls us to be a preacher or a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary and then, or a church leader. And in that, that moment that God's calling us, we doubt God and we don't believe that God is really calling us to that. And, and I believe that sometimes when we find ourselves in trouble, it's because we've, we've lost sight of God and we can't see him anymore. And then we're seeing, okay, how can this transpire? How can this happen? I remember distinctly, Dr. Dickerson, the day that God called me to preach. I remember sitting in, in my one-room apartment, sitting at the table with my wife then, and we were sitting there, and, and, and I was reading and praying, and, and, and as I was doing that, all of a sudden I was overwhelmed with the feeling as though God wanted me to speak. And then all I could do is just picture me standing behind a pulpit for some reason. I could not understand. I said, there is absolutely no way. Something's wrong with this. And I, I told my wife about it. I said, this is, I don't know what's going on. And I don't know what's happened, but this is not real. You know, to know me back then, and probably I'm still the same way now, but I had a fear of standing before people. I could not speak before people. And to have that come to me, it was like, there is absolutely no way you can use me, Lord. And so sometimes we get like that, don't we? And I think one writer said this, what frightens us the most are the things we believe God desires for us to do and move toward, but yet we see it as something that is impossible. And when we see it as something impossible, then we lose faith and we lose confidence. You know, what about also times of God directing us? 
God directing us and God telling us to move, whether it's God telling us inside of our ministry, you know what, you need to move into this particular area inside of your community and you need to minister to these people. You need to evangelize to them and then you look back at God and say, you really want me to go there? You really want us to put our efforts there? And then what about God telling you to plant a church or what about God telling you to start a, uh, another ministry, if you will, and then you're, you're asking God to start another class or, or start another lesson or something like that. And then we're down in God saying, well, God, how is it that you could really use me to do this? And how is this even possible that something good could come out of this? But not only do you see the unbelief that takes place here, but then we're going to see a, transpire, uh, a transition, if you will, to belief. Listen to what the text goes on to say. Verse number 26, and it says this, And after eight days, his disciples were again inside. After eight days, a week later, from one Sabbath that Jesus had seen them, now this is the next Sabbath. And it says this, and they were inside, and Thomas was with them. Thomas is with the other disciples now. And then the scripture says, Jesus came, and the doors being shut and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace to you. We see that here Jesus appears again. Jesus doesn't need the doors to be open in his resurrected form, but he appears to them. And when he appears to them, and he actually states to them, Peace be unto you. One writer said this. One writer said that because a week had transpired, then Thomas had missed a wonderful week of blessings. But anyway, it goes on and say this, but Jesus appears there and he says, peace be unto you. No doubt that the other disciples that were there, they had the door shut, maybe because they were uneasy, maybe because of the state of the situation. Jesus is not around and then Jesus comes and he tells and proclaims peace to them as a way of comforting them as he appears to them. But then listen what happens next in verse number 27. It says, then he said to Thomas, he speaks directly to Thomas and he says, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it in my side do not be unbelieving but believe we see here in this text that when Jesus appears he speaks to Thomas and he doesn't speak to Thomas with criticism but he speaks to Thomas in a loving compassionate way and you know what we see in this passage of scripture what's moving Thomas from the state of unbelief to the state of belief or some things that will transpire are the same things that transpire inside of our life to move us from the state of unbelief to belief. Whether it's being from the lost state to the saved state or whether from our Christian life where we're moved into a state of unbelief to the state of belief. The first thing that God did is showed his compassion to Thomas. Thomas felt the wonderful love and compassion, the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. You know, that's one of the compelling factors that you see here in this text is that you see God speaking to him and then you see Jesus speaking to him and telling him, come here to me, touch me, feel me. It's like he's comforting him. But it's interesting too because you always ask yourself this question, how did Jesus know this? It's interesting because at the nearing the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, we see that what is taking place at the beginning of his earthly ministry. And that's where he actually saw Nathaniel while he was under the fig tree at the beginning of his earthly ministry. Near the end of his earthly means he's still doing the same thing, showing himself to be God. He knew exactly what was going on with Thomas. He knew exactly what Thomas demanded that he have transpire. And you know what? That brings us to another point, too, for our lives, and that is this, is that God knows exactly what we need. And listen to what the text goes on to say. He tells him not only to come here and, and he says, look at my hands. And then he says, reach your hand here and put it into my side. He says, do not be unbelieving, but believe. What we see here is now we see Jesus telling Thomas here to stop going down the road of unbelief. Thomas, some writers have said, has been moving toward a, a life right now at this time of faithlessness. And then God, through the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, speaks to him and he tells him, stop going down this road. Stop going down the road of unbelief. But now only believe. And what we see here is he's telling him, only trust me. Only have faith in me. Believe in me now that I have been resurrected. Bruce says this, Thomas expresses his faith in a language that goes beyond anything that had been used in his fellow disciples when he makes the next statement. This is what Thomas says next in the text. It goes on to say, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. 
We see that he identifies Jesus again, maybe as his master, as his rabbi, by calling him my Lord. But here Thomas makes a statement that has not been made by any of the other disciples when he calls him my God. He now moves from a state, if you will, from the unbelief to the belief, but he moves further to a state of belief. Not only he's recognizing Jesus as his Lord, but now he's recognizing Jesus in his state as God. And notice in the text here that Jesus does not do anything to correct him when he makes the statement. And the reason that he doesn't do anything to correct him in this statement is because the statement that he's making is absolutely true. Listen to what verse number 29 says. It says, And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. In this passage of Scripture, he tells Thomas, he says, you know what? He says, uh, Thomas, he says, because you've seen, you've believed. But now blessed are those that have not seen but yet believe. That word blessed not only goes to mean happy, but through most renditions it means to be satisfied with what God provided. For us as believers today, for those of us, the church, after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have moved to a state of happiness that's different from those that have been blessed to have seen Jesus, walked with Jesus, or even seen the resurrected Lord. And the Bible tells us, or through Boyce, I think it is, that stated this, that we're more satisfied today and we, because of the belief that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ by not seeing him. He says this, he says, more blessed than those who have seen that needed a vision or needed a miracle to etc to believe we that we have believed through the words of the apostle and through the lord jesus christ and therefore faith without sight is more praiseworthy than faith with sight and so in this text we see here that this transpires and we see that through Thomas's belief, through Thomas's following, through not only feeling the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ, but through him following his word, he moves to a point of belief. You know, what about us today? What's going to move us from that point of unbelief to belief? You know, when we see the times of troubles that transpire inside of our lives, when we see the time of a calling that God is placing on side of our life, we're doubting God, when we see God directing us with inside of our lives, then what are we to do in those moments that we doubt God and we are not believing that God is capable to bring these things to pass? Well, it's a simple answer. Only believe. Only believe in the sense that you're going to trust God. You're going to have faith in Him. But you're not only going to trust Him and have faith in Him, you're going to trust Him with His power. That He has the ability. That He still is God. That God has not grown feeble. He's not grown weak. God has not aged. His eyes have not become dim and His ears hard of hearing. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's still ruling and reigning over everything and even the circumstances inside of our life. But then not only that but we're going to trust him with his promises the promises of his word the promises that he teaches us in his word that that he will forever be with us that he will never leave us nor forsake us and it also teaches us that in our weakness his strength is made strong we take him at the promises of his word but then we also take him at his provisions that God will provide that God will equip and provide the necessary things that we need to fulfill whatever it is that he's calling us to do you know I love uh uh, Dr. Ralph Richardson. Dr. Ralph Richardson was a wonderful, wonderful man, and I, I dare to have called him a friend. I spent a lot of time with Dr. Ralph Richardson, not only here at the school, but also in his ministry. And in one of the classes that I had with him, Dr. Dickerson, he made a statement about faith. And the statement that he made about faith, I've never forgot it. And he said this, he says, faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances or situations. And you know, when we think about that, that's exactly what we have to do as Christians, don't we? If we ever move into a state of unbelief or doubting God at His capabilities or what He's calling us to, then all we have to do is just take Him at His word, stay faithful to His word, follow His word, and watch how things transpire. You know, in Santa Claus 2, at the end of that movie, or in that section of, uh, of the movie where... Charlie is speaking there with Miss Carol, the principal, and he shows her that globe, and then she believes that as a result of her seeing it, Charlie makes another statement to her. Charlie makes the statement, he says, seeing is not believing. He says, believing is seeing. And you know what the Bible teaches us is that we have to walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible also teaches us that without faith, 
It's impossible to please God. You know, the wonderful thing about, about this whole passage of Scripture as I looked at it is that not only did I doubt God in the preparation or aspect of it, and some of us, we do that as well, but I also see in this beautiful passage of Scripture how God can take that unbeliever and bring him to the point of salvation. See how God has brought us from the point of non-belief to belief so that we might be saved. God extends his mercy and his compassion and his love to us through the power of the Holy Spirit drawing us to himself. And then from that we follow his word and his word that teaches us that if we would believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, we shall be saved. And so maybe if there's someone out there today or watching online that has not surrendered their life to Christ today, surrender your life to Christ today before it's too late. He loves you today. Will you pray with me? Dear gracious God, Father, we thank you so much today for your word. We thank you, Lord, for what your word teaches us. We thank you, Lord, for the example that we have seen through Thomas's life and how he was in a state of unbelief, but how he believed. And Lord, we thank you most of all for the wonderful principles that we can gather and incorporate in our life because we're not much different than Thomas. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us today. Help that one that may be in a state of unbelief as it pertains to salvation and bring them to the point of belief. We ask all of these things in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. It's been time well invested. And we're blessed to have Dr. Whitfield as a faculty member now and look forward to uh, sharing in the Word together even more. So thank you for coming and sharing, also for your wife being here as well. And uh, for each of you students, we're praying for you to be able to finish strong in these very challenging days coming up to the end of the term. <laughs> so we're praying for you, praying for you. <laughs> and as a great message for someone coming toward the end of a semester, that's for sure. Let's, uh, let's meditate on that and take it to heart through the day as we entrust ourselves to the Lord. One final announcement before we are dismissed, and that is spring registration is open. So you also have to think about the next term and keep planning and plugging away. If you have any questions concerning upcoming registration, please uh, check with your advisor or talk with any of us or call us here on the college. All right, thank you so much. We're dismissed. God bless. So sign up for Culture of the Bible. Culture of the Bible. <laughs>